Welcome back. Today, I will be reading to you from this book. It is called Birds That Every Child no by Milchi Blanchan. This book was published in 1909 and I have been reading chapters of this book on my channel since I started. I got this book um, for free from a library that was giving away old books, and I love it. So, if you'd like to hear more chapters, I have a playlist of all of the bird, um, bird book chapters I have read. And it's almost three hours, I think, at this point. So if you like um, to have ASMR in the background um, as you're doing things, that might be a fun playlist to check out. But for today, we are going to be reading about the flycatcher family. I believe, I think that's where we are. <laughs> we are all the way up to chapter 11 in this book. Do a little uh, page flipping. Chapter 11 The Flycatchers Kingbird Crested Flycatcher Phoebe Peewee When you see a dusky bird smaller than a robin lighter gray underneath than on its sooty brown back with a well-rounded, erect head set on a short, thick neck, you may safely guess it is one of the flycatchers. If the bird has a white band across the end of its tail, it is probably the fearless kingbird. If the feathers on top of its head look as if they had been brushed the wrong way into a pointed crest, moreover, if some chestnut color shows in its tail when spread and its pearly gray breast shades into yellow underneath, you are looking at the noisy, wild Irishman of birddom, the crested flycatcher. Confiding Phoebe wears the plainest of dull clothes with a still darker, dusky crown cap and a line of white on her outer tail feathers. She and the plaintive wood peewee, who has two indistinct whitish bars across her extra long wings, are scarcely larger than an English sparrow, while the least flycatcher, as you may suppose, is the smallest member of the tribe to leave the tropics and spend the summer with us. Male and female members of this family wear similar clothes, fortunately for every child who tries to identify them. You can tell a flycatcher at sight by the way he collects his dinner. Perhaps he will be sitting quietly on the limb of a tree or on a fence as if dreaming, when suddenly off he dashes into the air 
clicks his broad bill sharply over a winged insect, flutters an instant, then wheels about and returns to his favorite perch to wait for the next course to fly by. He may describe fifty such loops in mid-air and make as many fatal snapshots before his hunger is satisfied. A swallow or a swift would keep constantly on the wing. A vireo would hunt leisurely among the foliage. A warbler would restlessly flit about the tree, hunting for its dinner among the leaves. But the dignified, dexterous flycatcher, like a hawk, waits patiently on his lookout for a dinner to fly toward him. All things come to him who waits, he firmly believes. None of the family is musically gifted, but all make a more or less pleasing noise. Flycatchers are solitary, sedentary birds, never being found in flocks, but when mated, they are devoted home lovers. We are apt to think of tropical birds as very gaily feathered, but certainly many that come from warmer climates to spend the summer with us are less conspicuous than Quakers. Kingbird, called also B. Martin. In spite of his scientific name, which has branded him the tyrant of tyrants, the kingbird is by no means a bully. See him high in air in hot pursuit of that big, black, villainous crow who dared to try and rob his nest, darting about the rascal's head and pecking at his eyes until he is glad to leave the neighborhood. There seems to be an eternal feud between them. Even the marauding hawk that strikes terror to every other feathered breast will be driven off by the plucky little kingbird. But surely a courageous home defender is no tyrant. A kingbird doesn't like the scolding catbird for a neighbor, or the teasing blue jay, or the meddlesome English sparrow. But he simply gives them a wide berth. He is no Don Quixote, ready to fight from mere bravado. Tyrannus, Tyrannus, is a libel. For years he has been called the Bee Martin, and some scientific men in Washington determined to learn if that name is deserved. So they collected over 200 kingbirds from different parts of the country, examined their stomachs, and found bees, mostly drones, in only 14. The bird is too keen-sighted and clever to snap up knowingly a bee with a sting attached, you may be sure. But occasionally he makes a mistake when, don't you believe, he is more sorry for it than the beekeeper. He destroys so many robber flies, a pest of the hives, that the intelligent apiarist, who keeps bees in his orchard to fertilize the blossoms, always likes to see a pair of kingbirds nesting in one of his fruit trees. From a favorite lookout on a tall mullen stalk, a kingbird neighbor of mine would detect an insect over 170 feet away where no human eye could see it, dash off, snap it safely within his bill, flutter uncertainly an instant, then return to his perch, ready to loop the loop again at any moment. The curved clasp at the tip of his bill and the stiff hairs at the base helped hold every insect his prisoner. While waiting for food to fly into sight, the watcher did a good deal of calling. His harsh, chattering note, ching ching, which penetrated to a surprising distance, did not express alarm, but rather the exultant joy of victory. Crested Flycatcher Far more tyrannical than the kingbird is this wild Irishman 
as John Burroughs called the large flycatcher with the tousled head and harsh, uncanny voice who prowls around the woods and orchards, startling most feathered friends and foes with a loud, piercing exclamation that sounds like, What? Unlike good children, he is more often heard than seen. That the solitary, unpopular bird takes a mischievous delight in scaring its enemies, you may know when I tell you that it likes better than any other lining for its nest a cast snake skin. Is it any wonder that the baby flycatcher's hair stands on end? If the great crest cannot find the skin of a snake to coil around her eggs or to hang out of the nest, she may use onion skins or oiled paper or even fish scales. For what was once a protective custom, sometimes degraded into a cheap imitation of the imitation in the furnishing of her home. Into an abandoned woodpecker's hole or a bluebird's cavity after the baby of these early nesters have flown, or into some unappropriated hollow in a tree, this flycatcher carries enough grasses, weeds, and feathers to keep her nestlings cozy during those rare days of June, beloved by Lowell, but which Dr. Holmes observed are often so rare they are raw. Phoebe, called also Bridge Peewee, Dusky Flycatcher, Water Peewee. The first of its family to come north, as well as the last to leave us for the winter, the Phoebe appears toward the end of March to snap up the first insects warmed into life by the spring sunshine. Grackles in the evergreens, red wings in the swampy meadows, bluebirds in the orchard may assure us that summer is on the way, but the homely, confiding Phoebe, who comes close about our houses and barns, brings the good news home to us every hour. Pewit Phoebe, Pewit Phoebe, he calls continually. As he perches on the peak of a building or other point of vantage, notice how vigorously he wags his tail when he calls and turns his head this way and that to keep an eye in all directions, lest a bite should fly by him unawares. Presently, a mate comes from somewhere south of the Carolinas, where she has passed the winter. For Phoebes are more hardy than the rest of the family, and do not travel all the way to the tropics. With unfailing accuracy, she finds the region where she built her nest the previous season, or where she herself was hatched. This instinct of returned direction is marvelous, is it not? Sometimes it is hard enough for us humans to find the way home when not ten miles away. Did you ever get lost? Birds almost never do. Phoebes like a covering over their heads to protect their nests from spring rains so you will see a domesticated couple going about the place like a pair of wrens, investigating niches under the piazza roof, beams in an empty barn loft, and projections under bridges and trestles. By the middle of April, a neat nest of moss and lichen, plastered together with mud and lined with long hair or wool, if sheep are near, is made in the vicinity of their home of the year before. The nursery is exquisitely fashioned, one of the best pieces of bird architecture you are likely to find. Some over-thrifty housekeepers, nevertheless, tear down nests from their piazzas because the poor little Phoebes are so afflicted with lice that they are considered objectionable neighbors. 
Many wild birds, like chickens, have their lifeblood drawn by these minute pests. But a thorough dusting of the Phoebe's nest with Persian powder would bring relief to the tormented birds, save their babies, perhaps from death, and keep the piazza free from vermin. No bird enjoy a bath in your fountain or water pan more than these poor tormented ones. From purely selfish motives, it pays to cultivate neighbors ever on the lookout for flies, wasps, may beetles, click beetles, elm destroyers, and the moth of the cutworm. The first nest is usually so infested that the Phoebes either tear it down in July and build a new one on its site, or else make the second nest at a little distance from the first. The parents of two broods of from four to six ravenously hungry, insectivorous young, with an instinctive desire to return to their old home year after year, should surely meet no discouragement from thinking farmers' wives. Shouldn't you think that baby Phoebes reared in nests under railroad bridges would be fearfully frightened whenever a train thundered overhead? The Wood Pee-wee When you have been wandering through the summer woods, did you ever, like Trowbridge, sit down beside the brook irresolute and watch a little bird in suit? Of somber olive, soft and brown, Perched in the maple branches, mute. With greenish gold its vest was fringed, Its tiny cap was ebon-tinged, With ivory pale its wings were barred, And its dark eyes were tender-starred. Dear bird, I said, what is thy name? And thrice the mournful answer came. So faint and far, and yet so near, Pee-wee, pee-wee, peer. Doubtless this demure, gentle little cousin of the noisy, aggressive, crested flycatcher has no secret sorrow preying at its heart. But the tender pathos of its long-drawn notes would seem to indicate that it is rather melancholy. And it sings, in spite of the books which teach us that the flycatchers are songless perching birds, from the time of its arrival from Central America in May until only the tireless indigo bunting and the red-eyed vireo are left in the choir. In August. But how suddenly its melancholy languor departs the instant an insect flies within sight. With a cheerful, sudden sally in midair, it snaps up the luscious bite, for it can be quite as active as any of the family. While not so ready to be neighborly as the Phoebe, the Pee-wee condescends to visit our orchards and shade trees. When nesting time comes, it looks for a partly decayed, lichen-covered branch, and onto this saddles a compact, exquisite cradle of fine grass, moss, and shreds of bark, binding bits of lichen with spider's web to the outside until the sharpest of eyes are needed to tell the stuccoed nest from the limb it rests on. Only the tiny hummingbird, who also uses lichen as a protective and decorative device, conceals her nest so successfully. And that concludes our chapter on Thank you for being here with me.